Good morning, everyone, and thank you very, very much for coming. Um, this is the first of our uh, public forums when it comes to our new fiscal year 2024 budget. I am Bill Schwinn, the general manager here at Sun City West, uh, into my fourth year, and we have some staff members here that will be uh, speaking as well, uh, talking about various concepts of the areas that they supervise, moving into the explanation as to where we are and where we feel we're going. So a couple of, couple of things, we do have a microphone here. If there are any questions, we'd like for you to please to come up to the microphone, state your name and your ID number for the record, and we will do our best to answer any and all questions that you, that you have. We'll hold those to the end of the presentation, if that's okay. Um, and with that, we will kind of get rolling. So here we are today, and here we are 1978. A little bit of a groundbreaking. Um, key players here, uh, second person on the left, Dennis T. Cancini, pretty much known as the godfather of water in the state of Arizona, um, responsible for a lot of the groundwater laws that came into place back then, still in existence today, and how we benefit from that. It was huge, a gigantic, a gigantic issue then, and it still is now, but allowing us to do what we do with groundwater and our golf courses is absolutely a wonderful deal. Mr. Meeker, Mr. Kuntz, Mr. Johnson, all there, uh, names and buildings named after these people, man, this was all good. Del Webb had passed away at this time, he passed away in 1974. Uh, Katie informed me that uh, May 17th we'll be having a birthday party for Mr. Webb um, uh, here at the, uh, the facility and we'll also be showing um, pretty much the history of, of Sun City West and how this has developed over time. So if you have an opportunity to come by and see that, please do. But let's go back to 1978 a little bit, right? The cost of eggs were what, 67 cents, 82 cents, gas was 67 cents a gallon. I do remember those days. Um, pretty amazing, really. Um, during the NBA championships, there's a team called the Washington Bullets. I don't know if they'd get away with naming that team that this today's day and age, but that's who won the NBA back then. And then, I don't know if you all know, raise a hand if you know what a trapper keeper was. But whatever that one, two, <laughs> I didn't know. I had to look that up. But that was invented back in 1978. It's basically a three-ring binder that you close and you keep all your pencils and your goods in it and whatnot. Don't know why I'm talking about that, but I just thought that was kind of bizarre uh, coming across in 1978. Um, the other thing, um, and I think our Zymergy Club would appreciate this, but President Jimmy Carter at the time signed a bill which allows us to do home brewing. So wonderful there. <laughs> But just moving on, how things have changed and some of the famous things going on back to 78. Here we are four years later, after the groundbreaking. This is what Sun City West looked like in 1982. So as you can see, the, the commercial district uh, there, the, the, uh, the rec center at R.H. Johnson is there. You can see Hillcrest and all of the model homes that were kind of there used for and hotels that were actually used for folks to rent to kind of get a taste of what Sun City and Sun City West might be like. And then here we are 45 years later, built out, and you all are experiencing what was laid down in 1978 and moving forward. Um, a pretty wonderful um, environment here, and I'm glad you're here, and I hope you can say the same about yourselves. So what's different in Maricopa County than a normal residence, right? We are a planned community. So we fall under the rules of the Arizona State legis Legislature when it comes to what are we, right? We're a, we're a real estate development that includes real estate and owned and operated by a nonprofit corporation. That's us. And we are created for managing and maintaining the property, right? Which are owned by separately owned lots and parcels and units, that, but you are mandatory members and required to pay uh, assessments to the association for these purposes. So a lot of people come here, um, inherit homes um, from relatives and whatnot, don't understand planned community or the statutes that kind of go with that. HOA fees, annual dues, mandatory dues. We hear a lot of things like, I don't swim in the pools and why am I paying for that? Well, there's an educational process there. I don't golf, why am I paying for that? It's all under the umbrella of mandatory membership. Some people just don't understand that, inheriting property or coming in without really um, understanding what Sun City West is all about. So we, again, we are a 501c4 nonprofit organization and our earnings must exclusively be used in our case for recreational purposes. 
and then we serve primarily the community rather than private interests of its members. So taking that forward, nationally, there is a community association institute that kind of is a, is a, a kind of putting all of us together across the nation, right? There are a lot of associations like us. We stand out a little bit because we're pretty large. Sun City, the villages in Florida, some of the larger ones really stand out, but there are a lot of associations in this country dealing exactly what we do with, right? We nonprofit organizations looking out for bylaws and rules and regulations in a subdivision. In fact, there are 338,000 U.S. communities in our nation. That's large, right? And so community associations are headed by boards and committee members and over 2 million people volunteer throughout the year dealing with everything that we do. It's really, really amazing. But there's great research and there's great information to be had with this institute. They provide a great deal of information. A Retire Better Now page ranked the top 10 best 55 communities in the United States. Keeping in mind 338,000 of these things exist, we're in the top 10. So congratulations to you all as far as residents go. We're very proud of this and we wanna make sure we maintain the standards and your property values that go along with this ranking. So additionally, of, of the larger communities, over 2,600 of those were recently analyzed and, and they used factors like affordability, amenities and security features and Sun City West ranked number two nationally. We were right behind the villages in Florida. And so Coventry Insurance and Consumer Affairs has us ranked very, very highly. Again, we take a lot of pride in that, as do all of our staff, making sure that we maintain the standards that you've come to know and expect. So some of the research that has been done recently, um, again, it's data-driven and it's industry-focused, but which of the following areas are you seeing increased expenses, right? As we put this budget together, these are questions we ask. And this is exactly in our wheelhouse, right? So where are you seeing increased expenses, right? In management fees, insurance premiums, maintenance expenses, staffing, and landscaping. These are all kind of the central points of who we are and what we do. And so when asked how they plan to address the unexpected costs and cost increases, 73% of the folks interviewed basically plan to raise assessments. 41 plan to reduce expenses, plan to defer some maintenance projects, reduce some landscaping, and you can see the other responses there. These have all worked their way into our planning process and how we deal with what we're dealing with in the economy, right? We have wonderful venues here when it comes to recreational services and the community events that we provide, right? These are all wonderful um, venues, they are in quality condition, and you know, I, I think you'd be challenged to really realize that I think our newest venue that we have is over 25 years old. Pretty good, because they all look wonderful, and they play wonderful, and they, and again, hats off to a lot of the folks that are, have been here, Mr. Boston's been here for 30 of those years, looking after these facilities. Kudos to him and his team, because they do a terrific job making sure these places look practically new. Golf courses play exceptionally well. I don't know if you've played golf, but if you do and you do around the valley or want to do some comparables, the seven golf courses that are maintained by Sun City West, Todd Patty and his team are something to talk about. They are wonderful, right? And so of the 338,000 organizations and associations around the United States of America, you saw the top 10, I would say we're number one. I'm a little prejudiced as far as that goes because here I am, but hard to beat Sun City West as far as a premier active adult community. It really, really is a, go a good spot to be. So let's talk about our budget for 24, okay? My overall responsibility is managing the revenue and the cost elements of the association's income statement, right? That, that's, that's the easy part. So when we assess our revenues and how this place is funded, right, membership pretty much carries the load as far as that goes. Your annual dues, 
are, equate for 54% of our annual revenue, and golf is a close second. You know, Sports Pavilion, we do some food and beverage, we do some merchandise sales, rec center and events, concerts, and those types of things, and interest from our, from our bank statements basically make up the rest of our, our revenue options. So membership golf is key. And where do we spend our money? And I've been saying this ever since I've got here, we're basically people in power. We have a very long day. Um, our golf folks um, work, start, come in at like four in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, work through mid afternoon. Our rec centers are open at six. They close eight, nine o'clock at night. And then after nine o'clock at night, janitorial services take place. So when you show up at six o'clock in the morning, these things are shiny new and ready to go. So it's a long day for us. A couple hundred thousand hours annually, we have to, we have to make sure we got staff for. And that's a trick in today's world. But again, the utility costs that we have, running, um, running pumps for swimming pools, I don't know if you have a personal swimming pool in your backyard, but I know what your electric bill would look like if you do. But I've had several swimming pools in residence where I lived in and I know, what they, I know what they run. And you times that by seven, you times that by how many pumps and heaters that we have, keeping water at a desirable rate for the re residents here, it costs money, as do uh, running pumps to pump water throughout golf courses. Utility costs are large in our world. So when it comes to the goals, these are, these are established, right? So maintain and enhance the assets of the association. We don't, want, we don't want the place going downhill. We have a standard, we keep to it, and we wanna make sure things remain looking as nice as they are. We wanna meet or exceed the minimum revenue funding uh, and reserve funding to make sure that we have adequate money to be able to fix things when the need arises. We'll talk about the reserve study in a few minutes, but moving on to are investing in new capital projects. That is critical um, to make sure that things remain new, remain fresh, attracting new residents and making sure you all are taken care of um, with new and, and exciting opportunities here while residing and, and enjoying your retirement. And then our, like I said, our budget strives to maintain the standards <clears throat> that we've all come to appreciate. So the reserve plan and our fully funded balance is a program that we have adopted um, a while ago, and it is, it's very, very, very complex. There'll be some folks here, if you have any questions on our investments and how this works, be happy to answer any and all of your questions. But everything we buy has a lifespan. If it exceeds five years and it costs over $5,000, we document that, because we know it needs to be replaced. Whether it's an air conditioner, whether it's carpet, whether it's flooring, whether it's a refrigerator, Anything along those lines, including buildings, including asphalt and, and those type of things, everything is documented. There are thousands of items in this plan. And we know everything has a different lifespan, right? And so when that time comes and we know that has to be replaced, there is adequate funding in this reserve plan to cover that. So we don't have to come knocking on your door with a special assessment saying we need money. We don't ever want to do that. And that's what this plan helps us do. And our governing board has a very keen eye on this and they set policy that basically says that our fully funded balance can't be below 40% of what our replacement costs are. And so it's important that part of our annual dues go into this fund to make sure that we are rock solid when it comes to replacing things. I talked earlier about some of our newest facilities 25 years old. Things have to be replaced. Case in point, this fiscal year currently, we're spending six and a half million dollars on a golf course irrigation system that needs to be replaced, about four and a half million actually on that, and about another million and a half on turf removal due to what the state of Arizona is making us comply with back in 2025, or upcoming in 2025, I should say, when it comes to water conservation. So the course is still going to be beautiful, still going to play well, but just maybe 15, 20 feet in on the parameters of the of the golf course, we're not needing to water that turf anymore. It's kind of out of play anyway, but from a turf reduction standpoint, most golf courses, if not all golf courses in the Maricopa County area, need to reduce their playable turf to 90 acres. Any golf course, a new subdivision getting built anywhere around here where you see farmland in the future, if they decide to put golf courses in, will be restricted to 90 acres of turf. And so as a, as a water conservation plan. So that funding was there ready to go when we needed it based on this reservation plan. 
So we know in a few years, well, there's another golf course we have to do, not as extensive as Grandview. Um, a few years after that, excuse me, a few years after that, we have another golf course to take care of as well. But also in that mix, again, air conditioners, roofing, everything that we know we need to replace is, has a timeline and funding available to it when the time comes to go. So this is a very, very important part of putting our budget together. So today's economy, uh, this is kind of what I wake up to this inside my head when I take a shower every morning, like what's happening today? Um, a lot of things moving, there are a lot of moving parts, um, what we're dealing with and whatnot, but putting, putting the budget together in today's economy is a challenge, and, uh, and we'll get to some of those points, right? Um, we have a staffing issue, um, equitable pay for staff. We know we are people in power, but we need people to work to cover the hours and do the work necessary to make this association flow. We're dealing with staff shortages, um, down serious numbers in our landscaping crew, down a few in golf maintenance, and then finding folks obviously to work late hour shifts, midnight shifts, janitorial work, those types of things are very, very difficult to find. And so half of our employees live here. They're owner member residents just like you all and don't have to go outside the walls, get a little gain, a little income. Um, applications are available at the back corner. If you wanna, while leaving today, please pick one up. Um, but if there's any interest in that, please do. But uh, again, we're dealing with staff shortages. Minimum wage is a mandate that the, that the state puts on us. Every November, we kind of get a little email from the state of Arizona telling us what minimum wage is. We have to react to that. But you just can't react to minimum wage because as that creeps up, it affects people that are in positions a little bit higher than a minimum wage position and you have compression. So you have to get back to that equitable rate and that costs money. Inflation, probably the biggest thing that we're dealing with in the last couple of years anyway. This is probably, and I know you all feel it too. You buy eggs, you buy milk, you buy gasoline. We all do. We buy it in mass. So it, what affects you personally affects us in bulk. Um, we, we, and we'll see that shortly. And then supply chain issues. Sometimes we try to put things together, we miss a part, we try to order the part, and it's eight weeks later and those types of things. So. We're interested in that. So in the four years that I've been here, taking care of our golf courses is, is a very, very high priority. And the winter ryegrass that we put down to have these golf courses beyond playable in, a, in the winter season, which is our money-making season, our peak season, requires grass seed. And didn't know three years ago that how forest fires in the state of Oregon <clears throat> can affect us. But grass seed, typically the perennial rye that is used nationwide, is grown in the state of Oregon, Canada, and a little in Kansas. But fires and those types of things affect us. The price of grass seed has tripled since I've been here. Unbelievable. It was about a $300,000 operation three years ago. It's not that now. But the governing board understands the importance of golf, and we proceed, and we do this. And the golf courses show it. War across the continent, not even close to us, affects fertilizer cost, petroleum-based fuel products and chemicals. It's amazing how interrelated this whole supply chain scenario really, really is. And so these landscaping costs have really taken a hit over the last couple of years that we're trying to deal with. Inflation impact, right? 2017, minimum wage is eight bucks. Right, we're 13.85 now, and you hear it on the news. I hear it on the news. Everybody's saying it needs to be $15 an hour. That's going to have a cost effect on our fees and how we do things and what we have to do to pay people to work. A case of paper towels a couple years ago, 22 bucks. It's up 53 percent. We're paying 35 dollars now. I don't want to tell kind of stories out of school here, but you know when the when the pandemic hit. We were having people come into our recreation centers with empty rolls of toilet paper, rolling their own toilet paper and going home. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what we're up against. We're seeing that type of behavior. Um, you know, so fertilizer and gasoline, and this is kind of what we're at. Had a conversation this morning with Mr. With Mr. Patty and, and Mr. Swan, um, part of our program that's underway right now with as far as Grandview Golf Ir Irrigation Project. 
we're going to be trucking in um, some granite and landscaping stone uh, to put over the areas that we're no longer having turf. And the, uh, we're having a, there's a meeting going on as we speak next door um, with the contractors in there because they are struggling. They gave us a bid price, but when they put that bid price in, they didn't account for the price of diesel fuel today. So when they bring that granite and whatnot over from Lake Pleasant over to where we are now, there's going to be a parade of trucks coming here shortly to do all this landscaping work that we're going to be having with that project. And those trucks take gas, and that gas is expensive. And so they're in there talking about that now. What are we going to do? So we'll figure that out. But this inflation impacts us all. So when it comes to annual membership dues, right, we got to make a couple of assumptions here while putting the budget together, right? We've got mandated wage adjustments. We've got health insurance premium increase, overall inflation, golf course maintenance, supply chain issues, bank fees, and then our revenue options. You know, these are the levers that we can push and pull to kind of see what we can do to balance our budget, basically deal with member dues, golf rounds, what we can do with the increase in, in green fees and, and what's manageable, bowling lineage, and the asset preservation fees. Um, I'm going to go back up to a little bit on the health insurance, but we also have casualty insurance as well. And knowing that our, the average age of our employees is close to 70 years old. It's like 67 years old. Um, slips, trips, and falls, and people, you know, moving tables and chairs around, making a room set up from a, a, f a funeral celebration, you know, and then we have a concert the next, you know, a few hours later, we have to turn this room around. And, it, you know, these aren't young people doing that. And so we see a lot of issue when it comes to people getting injured. Slips and trips, you know, younger days, if you knock me on the ground, or if we're playing football or something, you get hit, you get back up. Not so much when you get into your older age. There's not a skate park here <laughs> for good reason. Um, but anyway, these are the things that, that affect us. So I want to talk a little bit about what your annual dues go to support. Again, we hear it that, you know, I don't play softball. Why am I, why am I having to pay for the betterment of that softball field? I don't play, right? But it's everything that we do, and this is what everyone sharing in this planned community goes to support. Not only the personnel and all the public relations stuff we do there, all the CCNRs that take place. Um, we've got 105, I believe, individual uh, HOAs inside the walls of Sun City West, all different rules. And we have staff that ma maintain and monitor those to make sure the property stays maintained, weeds don't get out of control, houses aren't painted wild colors, those types of things, there are rules and regulations there. Not everybody has an HOA that lives here. Some people just fall under the, the general umbrella of the rules and regulations within Sun City West. But there are some niches that have even tighter controls as well. So your fees go to offset that. We have guest registration. We have property transfers, all our capital improvement projects, banking fees, crisis management, our legal fees. Uh, we get sued periodically uh, from owner members and guests for various things that take place here, unfortunately. But those require legal action, which requires a fund to support that. As far as maintenance go, Russ has over 200 air conditioning units that we have to deal with. I mean, you got maybe one or two on your house. You know what those cost. So we deal with, we deal with that, replacing them when needed, but also maintaining them on a, on a daily and monthly basis. All the properties that we have from entryways to parking lots, a lot of asphalt. We got oceans of asphalt at our recreation centers that require assistance. All of our outdoor sport courts, like I said, I talked about utilities, all of our golf courses, lawn bowling, bocce ball. I mean, your dues, when you really divide that up, it's really quite the bargain for what you get here in Sun City West for what you're paying. So again, when this slide was put together, we had 481 employees. That changes every day. Some people come in, some people go, which is great. Um, again, 188 of those are full-time employees. The vast majority are part-timers, and the vast majority of them live here. And so that's a great hiring opportunity for us. We want to take advantage of that, and uh, we, we really encourage people to step up and be part of the team because we'd really, really love to have you. And so it breaks out into these 12 divisions right, from human resources and safety 
to golf and landscape, golf operations on the Pat O'Hara side, doing all the starting work and taking care of the carts and making sure people are respectful of their tee times and doing what they do, it's all good there. IT, our media, marketing, and library, our special events, our sports pavilion. I mean, it's all broken out for you as far as the departments that basically we deal with on a daily basis, right? But by hours, these are really our cost centers, right? Rec centers, like we talked earlier about, you know, how often and how frequent, they're open seven days a week, early, early in the morning till late evening. Um, our golf operations basically are when the golf tee times happen early morning till the end of day, and then the maintenance side are out there early, early in the morning and trying to maintain the golf courses while staying out of your way. Our general services and administration provides about 17% of the hours that we deal with, as well as the sports pavilion. So that's kind of how that breaks out as far as what our day looks like. And here's a little 10-year trend as far as what our full-time uh, equivalents kind of look like. Um, 2020, you can kind of see the big drop, and that's nothing unique to us. I think our entire nation has seen that. Um, but we're trying to bring that back up to a manageable uh, number so that we can cover all of the hours that we really, really need to do. Um, gaining on it, but not an easy task. So again, our major operational impacts, minimum wage, health care, inflation, labor, and weather. So when it comes to health care, here's a little snap of about a four or five year picture of what our health insurance premiums look like. Again, we have a lot of claims, we have a lot of issues, and unfortunately, this is the market. Uh, we do go out to bid on these. We do have a, a representative, uh, independent, working for us, uh, trying to find us the biggest and best deal, and this is where we are at. Unfortunate, but this is a cost that we need to take care of. Inflation, right? And the CPI, which is, an, which is a price index that basically tells us, you know, what things cost, both in your world and in ours. And the, the CPI was invented in 1914, and to 2022, it had an average inflation rate annually of about 3.26%, right? Looking a little bit closer to home here, the last five years, right around that number. But if you take a three-year or a two-year average, this is what we're up against in the last couple of years. And our, and our annual dues really have not kept up with that. So we've been struggling a little bit when it comes to what things cost, as has everyone. Labor shortage. Um, when we try to hire folks at minimum wage and you can go uh, put rice in a bowl and in an assembly line and get $19 an hour in an air-conditioned environment, um, tough to recruit against that when it's 118 degrees outside and we need someone to mow a lawn. Um, not easy, um, but again, part-time-ish kind of things, but this is, this is what we're after. And you see these help wanted signs, I swear, every store you drive by, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's every place, they're out there. Everybody's looking for labor. Um, we have 300 and some odd thousand tee times at our golf courses annually. And several days of month, Mother Nature decides she wants to play. And this affects us. And so over the last season, in March through, uh, or November through March of this year, we've been affected 43 times by Mother Nature. Frost delays and restrictions. A rain delay, a washout on our golf course costs us 1,500 rounds of golf. Do the math. An expensive day. Beautiful that we're saving water. Thank you, Mother Nature, for the, for the drink. But it does affect us financially. So anytime we have a closure, at these golf courses, it affects our revenue. It affects how we bring money in to basically maintain these courses and everything else that we do financially. It's tough. And so just kind of sharing with you some of the, some of the, the when we say we're down rounds of golf, it's not like we're not advertising. It's not like it's a, it's a trend that's going away. It's mother nature coming to visit oftentimes. So moving forward this year, talking with the golf committee and the budget and finance committee, all right, we're not planning for 330,000 rounds of golf this year. It's just not going to happen. 
We've taken a little bit of a hit. There's been some rain days. Again, every day washouts, 1,500 rounds. So we've dropped our anticipated golf rounds down a little bit. But in order to keep our revenue up, we're looking to pass some of that necessary revenue on to non-member rates, right? So when it comes to prime time in the wintertime, right, during our, our season, October through May, we're looking to increase non-member rates, public rates, $5 during the prime time season and, and $3 during um, twilight and a dollar during super twilight uh, to make up some of that revenue difference. And as far as member rates go during peak season, um, it's, it's been recommended that a $2 increase during the peak and transition season exists and then a dollar rate during the summer months. Asset preservation fees, another one of the levers that we talked about earlier as far as where, where can we bring in additional revenue to help offset these costs. Asset preservation fees, as you probably know, are the, are the buy-in fees. Anybody new coming in here, buying a, buying a home, pays an, you know, a buy-in or an asset preservation fee. Currently, we're at 4,200, I believe, and I think we're looking to go up to a $5,000 rate. Comparable associations, Sun City moved theirs up to 4,000. The brand moved theirs up to five. But again, home sales, we're seeing a, a pretty good dip as far as this year goes. We've been averaging about 1,200 a year. I don't think we're gonna hit that number this year, hence the increase that will help us offset some of that income. We're anticipating about a little over 1,000 homes to be sold by the end of the fiscal year. Um, but over the last couple of years, we've been really, really successful. I mean, there's been some huge tailwinds. I think year before last year, I should say, I think we hit it's like 1,600 homes. So very lucrative for us. And that, that, uh, that money all goes into the reserve study to help offset a lot of our capital and, and our, our, re our repair situation. So that's all good. A little bit of a pop in bowling as far as non-members go. People coming in, that their rates are going to go up to $4 a game. That's a 25-cent increase. Um, that is, however, the busiest bowling alley in the state of Arizona as far as the number of lanes bowled. That's a, that's a very busy facility. Um, Non-member league card rates goes up $5. We're looking to equate uh, the uh, sports pavilion cost of beer equal to our golf courses. So that's going up a dollar and the cans of beer go up 50 cents as well. And we're gonna see a little bit of a bump in our ticket pricing as far as our special events go. Um, the events that are coming in that have to travel, get here, do that kind of thing. They're increasing their prices too. We needed to, we needed to match that as far as um, making sure that we're making ends meet there when it comes to our special events. So it's not just raising fees. We do have an opportunity here where we can save money. And I want to let you know that, you know, we do put our best foot forward trying to make sure that we are doing that for you. So overall landscape and, and r and cost, um, we were able to kind of knock about 90 grand off of that. Our equipment expenses kind of dropped a little bit with all of the improvements that Carl and, and, his work has done with the lighting systems throughout our um, uh, recreation centers and our offices and whatnot going to LED lighting. We're seeing a, a sizable increase or decrease in our utility payments as far as electrical lighting goes. That's all good. And then enhancing all of our well pumps and our sprinkler head improvements um, with new equipment does save a lot of water and time. Um, and then looking at uh, our office supply vendors who we're dealing with as far as that goes, and, uh, and how we shop for supplies, we're saving a little bit of coin. One of the things I would like to highlight, though, in our, in our CC&R department, um, since we've taken that back over from Pora, um, we've implemented a, a computer program that gets us a little bit more in line with Maricopa County so that when property changes hands, changes names, we are uh, uh, notified a little quicker than days gone by. And so we're getting this money as opposed to taking 24 months or longer to settle through title transfers and passing of people and who owns what, where, and where do you live and trying to track people down, which was not really happening. Um, we've taken this program over. This allows us to stay a little bit more active, um, but basically it put about a million and a half dollars back in our pocket in a very timely fashion. So we're very, very proud of this and hats off to Riley and his team for um, operating this, but doing a very good job for us. So, like I said, the association deals with bylaws, policies, and those types of things, committees, and those kind of things. So we have rules that we follow. 
this isn't me thinking all of this up, right? There's a rule book. And so part of the rule book says that we are limited here as far as what the governing board can approve ultimately is a 15% increase in annual dues over a year. So we can't go higher than 15%, okay? The average dues over the last 30 years have increased 5.4% annually. That's what it looked like. So from a graph perspective, I don't know how, if the orange line or the top line is what the, what the owner member dues were paying, there's really no good way to plan for that, right? It's everywhere. So, and there, there really wasn't a mathematical science behind it. I wasn't here then. I can't attest for what really went down, but that is a little bit off to me. But what this chart really does show you is that the dues were always on top of inflation, what things cost, right? Until the last three years. And you can see where inflation has really taken a gain on us and our, and our annual dues have not kept up with what the cost of product is in the real world. And so a 20 year average has us at about a 6.1% increase in our annual dues, up a little bit from the 30 year average. Oops. So what we're proposing this year is a 6.1 average uh, or an increase to $540. That equates to $31 annually as far as adding that to the 509 currently being charged this fiscal year. And that's an increase of $2.58 a month. Back to the top 10. Again, of the 338,000 associations nationally, all paying dues, all paying, you know, HOA fees, that kind of thing. But regarding the top 10 as a comparable, here's where we sit. And so I still think at $540, as far as a top 10 measurement, as far as comparable communities, um, we're still sitting, I think, at a bargain. When you look a little bit more local, Westbrook Village raised their fees this year 8%. The Grand went up 7 Sun City Festival jumped 10 Pebble Creek up 14 And the number on the right shows what their actual, in, not rooftop, but actual individual dues are comparable to Sun City West. So we're going to, I'm going to take a little bit of break. Uh, Cliff Swan, our CFO, is going to come up and talk a little bit about our balanced budget and how we got there. Mr. Swan. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. I, uh, I get the exciting part of the presentation, the numbers. So, um, but, you know, we spent, this has kind of been a culmination of, uh, well, I guess we started probably in July, really, when we talk about capital. Uh, the capital side of the budget, but um, a lot of meetings, a lot of committee meetings, a lot of community engagement um, with the community and the different committees, and a lot of time spent uh, at, at the governing board level, the budget and finance level, uh, golf and uh, sports pavilion to generate these numbers. And, and I'm going to give, these numbers are going are, are to show the impact of the adjustments and the things to consider that uh, uh, Mr. Schwinn has just talked about. So um, again, we'll be happy to answer any questions regarding these numbers at the end of the uh, presentation. And, and we're always available um, after this meeting as well. So let's get started on the, uh, the numbers. So when we look at, um, when we look at the financial statement, first of all, we've got this posted. The latest version of this posted is from Friday's governing board meeting. So if there's a budget packet attached to that meeting, and that'll give more detail behind these numbers, and it'll give some more years. It gives 2021 through uh, budgeted 2024. But uh, for the purpose of this meeting, we show projected 23 or the current year that we're in and the budget year. So an overall 7% uh, increases, increase in revenue. And those are coming from our different uh, operating revenue areas in golf membership. Uh, we're fortunate we have a lot of levers we can pull here. 
uh, on the revenue side. So we try to spread that out as well as, um, you know, assign as much of this uh, to the commute, uh, to the non uh, members in that come here and utilize our services uh, and our uh, facilities. But uh, with those increases, uh, with the golf rounds that have been uh, budgeted, which is 315,000 rounds, uh, with our member dues increase, an overall 7% increase in revenue to generate a total of 28 million, 28.3 million to cover our 28.3 million operating budget. So on the expenses side, uh, looking at the different ex expense categories, uh, wages and benefits, uh, again, 65% of our overall expense structure, uh, a 7.5% increase in wages and benefits, and then an overall operating in increase of 7% uh, generates that $28.3 million operating budget. So as Bill said, we, we were presenting a balanced budget, and in the past, uh, we've we've had this um, line item called uh, revenue, or I'm sorry, uh, cash inflow outflow from operations, and essentially what that what that is, it's not profit; it's money that goes into our reserve fund. And so we've decided this year to present a balanced budget and take our uh, create a line item called estimated reserve fund allocation. And what we're doing is creating that line item to show that these monies are indeed going into the reserve fund and they're not sitting in the bank or being distributed in some sort of uh, profit uh, distribution or anything like that. These funds go directly into our reserve fund. This year it'll be 7% of our annual member dues revenue will be allocated uh, into that uh, estimated reserve fund allocation. So why are we, why are we doing this? Well, we wanna eliminate that perception that of profit, okay, because our reserve fund per policy states, FIO4 states that reserves are funded from the association's operating cash flow determined using the association's annual audited financial statements. So we wanna identify the amount needed in the reserve fund to pay for the repair and placement, as well as new capital improvements and stay within the FFB percent uh, per policy FIO4, which Bill talked about earlier as being 40%. So when we look at the capital section of the budget, uh, you'll see that down below in the capital section, once we pay to operate this facility, um, you'll see that line item right there, and it's called reserve fund allocation. And in this budget, we're estimating that we'll have a million to put into the reserve fund. And We'll also have uh, five five million seventy thousand coming from our APF fees. Uh, we're budgeting a thousand fourteen home sales uh, in this budget. So, and then we're also uh, taking the rate up to uh, five thousand for an APF fee, and that will ger generate uh, five million seventy thousand to also go into that uh, reserve fund. So uh, it's all about the reserve fund at the end of the day because uh, once we pay to operate this facility, once we pay our employees, once we, once we um, you know, uh, everything we need to do operationally to operate the, the golf uh, bowling center as well as the rec centers, um, we still have the repair and replacement of the assets in this community. And as Bill said earlier, this the buildings are anywhere from 45 to 25 years old at the rec centers. And we, we need funds to make sure that we can keep these facilities uh, repaired and we need to re replace certain assets and keep them looking nice. So to do that, um, we need reserve funds to do that. So as you can see, this is a model that has a five-year outlook on the reserve fund and the cash impact to the reserve fund. So you'll see the inflows into the reserve fund, which you have the, um, the reserve fund allocation that I talked about earlier. Then you have the APFs, and then you have investment income. That, that's our total inflows into the reserve fund. 
And then the outflows are the uh, repair and replacement, the capital items of those improvements that we talked about uh, for these facilities. And you can see that this year we're spending almost 11.3 million because there's a large irrigation project in there at Grandview. But six, 12, seven, eight and a half, and four and a half million over the next five years in repair and replacement. Those are on the reserve study that we have. And so the, the net impact of all of these uh, to the reserve fund is, is a roughly $2.8 million draw down on the reserve fund over the next five years. Now the reserve fund is measured against the fully funded balance. So that's how we determine how healthy our reserve fund. So our, our reserve fund is gonna drop to 2.8 million over the next five years. However, so will our fully funded balance as we repair and replace these items. So we take a percentage of the fully funded balance to see how healthy our reserve fund is. And as you can see, um, this year we'll be at 49%. And it will dip a little bit in 25, 6, and 7, uh, down to 45, 46%, and then back up to 49% by uh, projected uh, 2028. So uh, this budget um, puts us at 49%, and with this budget, it models out, again, at 49% by the end of five years. And that's something that uh, we, we have to consider when we're putting these budgets together. And uh, this, you, you all should be proud of this because this is a great position to be in because our reserve fund not only pays for the repair and replacement, it also covers new capital. And that's why we want that to be above 40% because we need funds for new capital as we continue to enhance uh, the association. I'd like to introduce Carl Wilhelm. Uh, he wears a couple of hats for us, but today he's gonna to be representing our capital improvement projects. He is our capital improvement project manager, uh, oversees all the wonderful things that go on here um, as far as taking care of our facilities. And Carl, the show is yours. And Todd will come up. Todd Patty <coughs> is our uh, golf course um, superintendent. He oversees all of our environmental services, all of our landscaping, golf course maintenance, and has for 30 years, sorry, 31. Um, and he will be talking about some of the golf course improvements that are planned for this year. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you. Uh, as uh, Cliff mentioned earlier, um, we begin each season July 1st with all of the requests from the community, um, staff, members, um, committees, uh, bringing information forward in the governing board, and we compile our capital uh, improvements list. Um, a very large component of this um, is the reserve study that uh, Cliff mentioned, and uh, those assets are allocated in that reserve study, so uh, I can see 30 years out what items are gonna get replaced on average after being reviewed and make sure that they actually deserve to be replaced. Uh, this is the proposed capital expenditures for uh, FY23-24. And uh, again, if you have any questions at the end of this um, uh, session today, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, FY23-24 proposed capital under 50K. We have the Beardsley Arts and Crafts shade structure, $45,000. This is a nice shade uh, structure replacing an old planter box over at the uh, Beardsley um, Arts and Crafts Building, uh, 18 by 31 shade structure with uh, pavers, and it just kind of uh, finishes that area after uh, we did um, parts one and two of a greenhouse and the garden club uh, expansion in that area last year. We have the Desert Trails Pro Shop storage area structure. Uh, this is currently an open masonry um, um, storage area that doesn't get utilized for our storage because there is no protection to the things that we can store out there. So we're proposing putting a roof over that area like we have at other um, pro shops. Uh, Desert Trails Pro Shop Patio Shade Structure. This is an identical project for 30,000 to expand the 
um, communities area to enjoy themselves after a game of golf. Uh, we'll be extending the patio and putting a shade structure, and, we, and this is identical project to what we did a year ago at Deer Valley. We have the R.H. Johnson facilities um, needs. Uh, part of those needs are uh, either replacement or due to changes in operation, adding vehicles or equipment, and this year we're proposing uh, a new pickup truck. R.H. Johnson social hall lighting renovation. Um, I don't know if anybody here remembers quite a few years ago, um, approximately five, uh, the sports pavilion um, has a unique ceiling similar to the social hall, and it kind of goes up and down like you see here. Uh, the materials um, are just aged and weathered from you know, uh, air conditioning, humidity, leaks, uh, things that just happen year after the year, and the materials to fix that are not available anymore. Uh, we're going into a, a design stage next year for $25,000 involving the architectural and uh, design um, engineers, and uh, then that'll compile the information on the best means of a future replacement of the social hall ceiling. So uh, the idea there in the future is to have a beautiful, little taller, flat, uh, sound, um, acoustic engineered uh, ceiling system and get us back into modern lighting, um, panels that can be replaced in case there's any damage from water and have a new uh, social hall look inside. And then uh, finally on the under 50K is the Sports Pavilion Lizard Acre sound system. Currently we just have a makeshift sound system in there. I think we've all experienced the growth that Lizard Acres has experienced and uh, we want to improve that sound uh, system for your entertainment purposes. Into capital projects that are over $50,000, uh, we have an R.H. Johnson parking lot, mill and replace for one million. Um, it's been my experience over the last six years to uh, recommend uh, where our parking lots have aged out and needed replacement. Uh, to date, we have replaced uh, Palm Ridge, the Coons parking lots, uh, a couple of the um, golf parking lots, and we're going to continue that process over the next couple years until we're 100% complete because all of our parking lots are 45 to 25 years old and uh, in due for replacement if you uh, were to review this list that we're going to show you. Uh, last year we completed um, R.H. Johnson's parking lot number two, which is from the library all the way to the automotive club. Um, Took a little over a month to complete. Um, is definitely impacted by not just replacing uh, asphalt for the purpose of having a new parking lot, but once we tear that parking lot, we're impacted by soils, conditions from 45 years ago. I anticipate that. That's all factored into these figures that you're seeing, and uh, we'll do our best to get this done late summer of uh, 23. Moving on to Beardsley, Beardsley's aquatics parking lot was done um, six, seven years ago, and uh, it has come due for the Beardsley arts and crafts portion of the parking lot to be fully replaced. Moving on, we have the sports pavilion bowl bowling lanes replacement. Um, also an aged facility as far as the lanes go. Uh, we have experienced uh, warbling in the lanes, in lanes one through six, and we can see it starting to continue into lanes uh, seven through 30. So uh, this summer, we are proposing to have all the lanes replaced. And while we do that, we'll also be replacing all the bowling return machines coming up in a slide. Uh, over at R.H. Johnson, uh, it is time to remove the uh, artificial turf at the bocce courts. Um, so 13 courts will have 100% of the uh, AstroTurf um, removed and replaced. Uh, we'll do some self-leveling of the concrete where either the courts have settled over the years a little bit to get the play true again for the club the best we can. And um, this involves replacing all of the artificial wood that supports the turf for uh, backer boards around the 13 courts. The R.A. Johnson pool deck resurface. Um, later this summer, uh, 
We are proposing to convert this from the cool deck that it is today, which is a concrete uh, surface um, so that you have a nice environment to walk on. Um, that deck is a little over six years old when the pool was refurbished uh, due to high traffic, high volume. It's our highest used pool each season. Um, it's just cool deck doesn't stand the test of time that uh, you would hope um, with the investment that it comes from. And we have tested this along with visited other communities, um, Sun City, um, hotels. Uh, Russ and I have taken a lot of time to investigate and see how uh, this rubber product is standing up across the industry. Um, and it's doing a really good job for us over at Kuntz. So uh, we're proposing to put uh, uh, the R.H. Johnson resurface into uh, the rubber uh, coating. Grandview Pro Shop is another parking lot for full replacement. Uh, this will be timed with closures that are currently scheduled for uh, this golf course and any other golf course that I'll show you, such as Trail Ridge. That parking lot will be fully replaced. Uh, we have uh, cardio equipment. Each rec center gets its uh, uh, cardio equipment replaced on a five-year cycle. So every one year we have one rec center turned on all of its cardio equipment and then we have a, a year of pause where nobody has any changes in the fitness area and Beardsley's cardio equipment is due for next season. Uh, next week in fact is the R.H. Johnson uh, change out just so you know all the cardio equipment and some new pieces will be introduced uh, next Wednesday. Look forward to you using that. Uh, R.H. Johnson Boulevard or uh, uh, this is a community project. Um, Russ and I are managing uh, vendors that will uh, submit bids for uh, refurbishing all of our walls. So if you go from Grand um, and R.H. Johnson Boulevard to R.H. Johnson Boulevard and Bell, we've got about four miles of walls. They're in that condition you see in the photo. So they need some touch-up, uh, stucco work, repairs, and then a full paint job. Russ also has on his plate a few areas along the Stardust Corridor if needed. Um, and that'll be addressed as well. Uh, yearly, we have HVAC units. We have pool heat heating equipment. Um, this particular budget, um, Russ knows that we need to do a pool heater replacement at Kuntz Rec Center. Uh, I also manage the roofs. Um, we do restoration before we do roof replacement. Everybody in in uh, and property management would rather restore a roof than replace one. The costs for re roof replacement are, are very large. So we do our best to stay on a warranty cycle of 10 to 15 years, depending on the product, by restoring those roofs every 10 to 15 years. What does that mean? Uh, simply, we have professionals come out, give us a, an engineered analysis of our roof. Can it support a restoration by putting down cleaning it up, tearing off some of the old materials of coatings and putting new coatings down. And we are able to regain another 10 to 15 years out of our roofs and don't have to get to the substructure where we'll actually have to replace at some point. Um, this is a great benefit to us and the metal shop is due for both its tile uh, underlayment, the felt, and the flat roof areas to be done. And then uh, just a review of some of the items under 50K again. We had the Beardsley Clay Club flooring project. Um, this is a refurbishment of their current uh, VCT. We'll replace that and put down some uh, acrylic epoxy chip coat. And they'll have a new, new uh, flooring in there. We have multiple HVAC units for next year. Uh, a bowling area sound system improvement. Uh, a, a auto scrubber for maintaining our pool decks at Beardsley and the uh, R.H. Johnson Lawn Bowling Flat Roof Restoration, a nice small roof there that needs to be restored. Um, each year we have allowances. Allowances are categories of items that are unexpected, but you have to plan for them. We have emergencies. Um, we have uh, ideas that come up from governing board committee meetings that uh, end up getting approved and they're out of cycle improvements for your benefit as the community so we have some unexpected projects each year and then the unknowns of any structural or integral um, building issues that need to get addressed and we create an allowance 
These are usually the categories that it falls under, and this totals $400,000 in allowances. And um, from a year-to-year -year basis, rarely do we spend all those funds, uh, but they are available in case an emergency arises or a need. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Todd. Todd uh, manages all of our golf operations and maintenance, or golf maintenance uh, operations, and he also has a capital items division. All right, thank you, Carl. Yeah, good morning. Um, as Carl mentioned, I have a, a few items that I'll go through. Our capital uh, equipment replacement, also some capital projects for the 23-24 budget. Uh, the first one is our golf maintenance equipment uh, for uh, plan for 985,000. Uh, that includes fairway mowers, rough mowers, bank mowers, uh, bunker rakes, greens rollers, uh, turf sweepers, and just general equipment that's used every day on the golf course for maintenance. Uh, I'd like to note that this is for all seven golf courses, that uh, 985000 or it works out to be about $140,000 per course. Now, you'd think that that really gets you a lot of equipment. It really doesn't. If you look at a fairway mower or you look at a rough mower, that we're spending $120,000 just for one unit. So we're not getting a whole lot of equipment. Our utility vehicles, 169005 This is just a little bit of a breakout per golf course. And that's our light weight and heavy duty uh, utility vehicles that we use every day on our golf maintenance. Uh, we review this program, or it's all listed in the reserve study, and we review that every year, and we do make changes to that. In fact, I think this year we moved three units out of it into another year. So if we find a piece of equipment that doesn't need to be replaced, even though it's on a reserve study, we'll move that out to another year instead of purchasing. So there's a little bit of savings in the, in the, in the current budget on that. All right, our shoreline project over uh, at Stardust this year on hole number 14. Uh, once we complete this project, that will finish uh, Stardust completely with the shoreline or some form of hardscape around there. So this is important, that hardscape. Not only does it look good, but it also helps conserve water, save water through seepage. So this is a really good plan. Uh, as you know, we've, we've done a number of, uh, of lakes throughout the, uh, throughout the other golf courses, and we've seen a noticeable difference in water usage just by uh, reducing the seepage on those lakes. Echo Mesa Golf Course Irrigation System Design Work for 206,000. Uh, the project is actually scheduled for 2025, and it'll be similar to what we're doing over at, at Grandview this year. Uh, we're not removing as much turf. I think Grandview is by far gonna be the biggest project of all the golf courses, but we are gonna look at taking about 10 acres of turf out this is gonna help put us in compliance with the state's ADWR mandates on water usage. Uh, uh, Grandview Golf Course uh, car pass slurry sale, this will take place after they finish the project. So once they're out of there, we can get in and do the slurry sale and some repair work on the car pass, and then that will be right before our overseeding that we go into, and then we'll open up the golf course. I believe it's October 24th and everything should look good. New car paths, uh, kind of a new design of golf course. Um, so I think you'll, you'll be happy with the improvements that we're making over there. You don't see a lot of improvements with the, with the irrigation system because it's all underground, but I think with the desert landscape, I think it's gonna have a nice clean look to it. And then in golf operations, we have 20 uh, carts uh, scheduled for replacement. Again, this is for all seven golf courses for 123,006. And then our items uh, that we have under 50,000 uh, landscape, we have a pickup truck uh, scheduled for this year for replacement. Grandview Lake aeration on hole six and eight. That's very important to have that lake aeration out there. It, it produces a healthy lake, uh, reduces the number of treatments that we have to have. Um, we use a, have a outside company come in and do those treatments and every time they come out, it's, it's 1,500 to $2,000 per lake to do those treatments. So having a good aeration, Putting oxygen into water is very beneficial for the health of our lakes. Trail Ridge, we have in golf operations, we have a ball picker cart uh, scheduled for replacement, and then at Desert Trails, also in golf operations, a utility hauler. And that concludes my portion of, of the budget, and I'll turn it back over to over to Bill. Kind of concludes our presentation, getting ready for Q&A, but the two gentlemen here, Todd and Russ, from our 45-year history, these boys have been here for 30 of it, 31 for Todd. 
And uh, a lot of the things that go on here, the quality of the facilities that, that exist, these folks and their teams are responsible for it. But I personally give them a, a yo on that one. Thank you very much. And so we talked about the 45 year history. If you take the three or the $540 proposed as far as our annual dues, it is a $31 increase, but it is $45 a month. And there's just a coincidence there. We didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> so Q and A, anybody wants to speak or have a comment? There's some staff up here. Mr. O'Hara, you want to come up? Case, Pete, if you have any questions on investments and you have any questions on anything that you have seen today, Katie, I don't know if you want to join us up here. You, you comfortable back there? Okay. Um, your name and your number, and we'd be more than happy to uh, to address anything that you'd like to, to talk about. Thank you. Betty Kendall, card card 104409. Um, I think we have excellent medical on property. That's drawing people into this community. And also, people that are new homeowners, a lot of them enjoy working in this community during January, February, and March. And then they go back to their other states the other months out of the year. So I feel at the present time, all community property must be repaired. Um, as far as the management expense of being 92%, well, I think the hourly employees need this increase in salary. Uh, with the neglect that we have, I didn't hear anything mentioned about the repair of the tennis courts, but um, I feel like everything on this ground needs to be repaired because it is community property. When you purchase property here, it's not explained to you. What you see when you purchase will not necessarily be available because of the lack of repair. The day-to-day -day maintenance is extremely important, I think, for the health and safety of the residents. And I think with this rec card fee, it's great how fast people can be processed when in January, February, March, when the pro shops are extremely busy with residents checking in, how fast they can move it with everyone using a credit card. Thank you. Um, uh, just to respond to the um, hourly employees, I just want the community to know that we do have, our budget does incorporate uh, an increase in uh, minimum wage. So we budgeted for that, as well as a overall 3.5% merit increase to, um, to, uh, to address any uh, compression issues from minimum wage, as well as any uh, wage increases uh, for all employees. And that'll be effective January 1. That's when we do our merit increases. So, and we did a lot of work this year in this year's budget as well to, um, we actually did a market adjustment in July of this year uh, to address some of those concerns. So I'm glad you're uh, thinking about those things and I just want you to know we are addressing them. Uh, my name is Mike Gilpin. My number is 114833. I have a couple of questions. Have you considered, instead of redoing the cart pass with chips, or have you ever considered doing them just natural with sand or anything like that? And would it be feasible? Uh, we no, we haven't uh, we haven't considered that yet. I mean, that's that's something that we can we can certainly look at. But um, you know, right now we're on a program to uh, we do a crack seal and, and a slurry seal on all of our our uh, blacktop uh, car paths. You know, we have three courses where we have, or excuse me, we have two courses where we have concrete car paths. But uh, we haven't um, no, we haven't looked at that at this point. Doing that. Well, I used to live in California for thirty years and finally escaped. But what they did over there is they would put like asphalt to the end of the fairway and then you would just scatter 
going out there. That was another thought. And my third, my second question, third question is, is that up at Trail Ridge, you put in an area for carts, an overflow area for carts, which is really a good idea because instead of parking them out in a parking lot where someone can come by in a pickup and take them, we're wondering if you're going to do that with all the other golf courses. But set aside an area because I know they, at the pro shops, they want all the carts out in the parking lot for obviously for people who are going to play. Um, I haven't looked at the other golf courses. I haven't heard anything. I know there was some concerns over there at, at Trail Ridge about uh, members parking out front where the pro shop couldn't see the carts when they were out playing if they had to leave their cart in the parking lot and then ride with somebody else. And so I haven't heard of that issue at any of the golf courses, but, um, but I'll certainly take a look at that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dennis Vanderplow, uh, membership card 140090. Just have a question. What I didn't hear, is there any further thoughts on the uh, credit card payment? You know, uh, charging back a certain percentage on credit card payment and that subsequent savings and what other options would the owners have? Yes, that is being addressed. Um, our, our governing board and our BNF committee um, will be studying that in the upcoming months based on bringing that forward to them. This, this isn't really a new concept. Um, you know, we've been paying bank fees all along as our, you know, how we do business. Um, but with the, you know, with the, the increase in number of card usage and the dollar amount that is now being generated via credit cards, how people are paying for things these days, um, it has elevated our, our bank fees, obviously. So if, if there's a way to convince owner members, you know, to pay with checks or to pay other ways, that's a way to reduce that number, um, paying with cash and those types of things. But, you know, we're weighing that, uh, checks do bounce. There are various things that we deal with, with checks, as far as that goes. So, you know, credit cards are a clean way to operate. Money's transferred pretty quickly and it's easy to account for. Um, but how we deal with our fees, other agencies out there, you may see restaurants, you may see other agencies out there adding a percentage fee onto the cart, the card use on a, on a swipe. That's one way to account for that. Um, but that's going to be studied, I think, by our BNF committee to kind of come up and do what is the most equitable and fair thing to us and, and kind of what we can do to minimize our cost to not only us operationally, but you as members. Thank you. Absolutely. My name's Arlene Foster, 125971. Thank you guys for your, all that you do. We appreciate you. Um, I do have a question on why the budget meeting is so late in the year, though, when all the snowbirds are leaving. I know that two weeks ago was supposed to have been the meeting, and I came for it. There was no sign saying that was not happening. It was in the paper that it was supposed to be two weeks ago. And I asked the office to put a sign up to let people know because people were showing up and nobody was here but it would, it's not fair to do it so late that none of the snowbirds can be here to hear what you're having to say right i appreciate that and it's not done intentionally I mean, we have a you know we operate on a fiscal year um, it does take us a while to assemble what we do carl talked a little bit about how we start this project in july um, no one here then, but we have to do all of our processing on our capital side first to get a to get a good look at where we're going as far as that goes. And by December of each year, we're barely into five or six months of our operating budget as to, you know, how we think we're doing moving into the following year. 
So it's just, it kind of, it's a timing thing when it comes to how we operate on a fiscal year note, as opposed to operating on a calendar year. You know, January mm -hmm. through December would probably be a little more optimal to capture um, winter, winter residents' uh, time here. Um, but the budget schedule and timeline has been established for a very long time. Um, a little bit of a hiccup uh, this year as far as postponing it a couple of weeks. Um, as far as posting that information out, we tried to get that information out as best as we could. Um, but there were still some things that we were dealing with operationally that kind of came up that we weren't really prepared to do this two weeks ago. I'm sorry. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, it is unfortunate or it's just a fact of life. Our budgeting season is dictated by the bylaws. And so to accommodate that, we're lucky we have um, YouTube um, that, that reaches residents anywhere they are in, in the world. Uh, they can watch this event in replay. Um, the entire proposed budget was in or will be in the May Rec Center News, which is available online. So even if you're back in the Midwest, you go online, pull up the Rec Center News, you'll see two full pages of the proposed budget on there. Um, so we've got a lot of different digital opportunities for people to participate, but as far as the timeline itself, it is dictated by the budget um, with the approval by the board in May, and then we start the fiscal year July 1. That two-week postponement was just because there was still a lot of um, proposals. We, we take input from the public through the different committee processes, and we revise the budget that way with that input, and so it did put us back the two weeks, and we did put uh, press out in all of our media, in the newspapers, and, and online. So um, hopefully that answers your question. It does, but Thank not you. everybody does online. So anyway. Um, so uh, just a couple of, a little bit more context to that. So, so there was specifically regarding uh, golf, uh, as well as rounds play. Um, again, like Bill talked about earlier, you know, when we start our operating budget process, it's in December, and a big part operationally in our, in our revenues and our expense structure happens basically January through March. So uh, when, we, when we're starting to look at the budget, it's a big part of our overall budget those three months. So specifically this year, uh, with the weather impacts, the uncertainty on golf rounds, as well as the communication around credit card fees and where we were going to go with that because it was a big consideration. Uh, we weren't ready to present. Uh, we didn't want to present something to the community that was half-baked, so to speak. So we wanted to make sure we had something pretty solid before we had this, this meeting. And last year we actually had it around this time. Uh, as well, but it is unfortunate that the budget cycle um, unfortunately falls right in the middle of people coming and going uh, but um, but we we also encourage uh, to encourage the community co to come to the committee meetings because there's a lot of discussion and a lot of q and a uh, that happens in those co committee meetings throughout the process, so starting in December through now. Um, and that's a, also a great way to ask questions and uh, give input. That's a great question, and um, unfortunately, we are strapped with that uh, okay. timeline. And then the other thing I had is um, on the parking lot, when you redo the parking lot, be sure that you don't take away parking spaces. I know one year you guys did the parking lot, and you put in fancy fancy things and trees and stuff and we lost parking spaces and the beauty did not make it worth it i have no intention of removing any parking or changing anything we're gonna it's status quo for what we have here at rh johnson and other than golf course continuation we are pretty much done for 25 years so great great and then the other thing on the swimming pool resurfacing on that new thing that you want to put down, is that going to last a long time, or are we going to end up having to replace that often? Well, our hopes is to get a 20-year 20, 20 life expectancy, at which is much greater than what we're certainly seeing out of our cool deck. And, in fact, over the six years that the cool deck has been down, we've, we've had to do a few repairs in the interim, which are just expenses, um, but... The cool deck does not come with a 20-year life expectancy. But also, you know, just to make it very clear, the rubber is something new. So we are that those are our hopes. We've done our homework. Uh, we're pretty impressed with all the places, but 
there is no place that we have an opportunity to go see a 20-year-old rubber floor. So um, to be continued, uh, we have great staff cleaning and maintaining. And the results today, after three years um, at Kuntz, I've had to do no repairs. Um, so we haven't had any failure points. We have a repair to do there, but it has to do with a water leak that appeared underneath. Um, but so far, we're tracking better than what we were at the cool deck. And it's a much safer environment for our members in case there was a trip, slip, or fall. So um, there's a lot of benefits. And, and we're in that testing stage a little bit too, so. Okay, you know. all right, thank you. You're welcome. And then it also, I appreciate the fact that you're keeping in mind that most of the people here are on budgets because if we're retired, we don't have increased income. So, all right, thank you. Please, my name's Wayne Nigren. Uh, my number is 128318. Uh, kudos to you all for what you accomplish. It's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask about the bowling alley. Is budgeting pressure causing so much outside league activity at, at, at the lanes? Uh, often it is tough to get in there to just play for the fun of it unless you're in a league. Uh, Barry and his, and his team do wonderful work. It's, it's a great, great place. But it's tough to get in there and uh, play. Thank you. Thank you, and I and I will tell you. Uh, unfortunately, Barry couldn't be here today. He has a, having a little surgical procedure going on, so we'll see him in a few weeks. But um, we ha have been meeting with Barry on that issue. We are noticing the based on the the availability of open bowling time is rather limited. Um, it's not really a financial issue. I think originally X amount of years ago, you know, the big desire is to let's maximize the use of that thing, and it has come with league play. Um, league play does offer and allow out of or non-resident use. We're studying what that percentage is and what it looks like because it's not fair for you as an owner member not to be able to participate in a league and get thumped by an outside member, right? A non-member. So we're looking into that and trying to come up with a very equitable and formidable scenario or fix to exactly what you're saying. So you should see some change. Thank you. I just have one more comment. Um, just as a point of interest, we've got about 19 people watching from home, so not a ton of a ton of people turning out for these forums, but you all took the time to be here, and we really appreciate that. You're showing an extra interest in this community than, than some other residents, perhaps. So I want to let you know about the opportunity with Torch, if you haven't heard about it. Torch is our Citizens Academy. So it's a seven week program held twice a year, um, every Thursday during those seven weeks. And it's a fantastic way to learn all the ins and outs of this association, how we budget, why we budget, where that money goes. There's a bunch of behind the scenes tours. You'll get to see the pin setting behind the bowling lanes. You'll get to see what Russ does back in maintenance and how these air conditions and, and everything works. So if you're interested in that, go to suncitywest.com torch or just stop in the front office and ask Carly about it. It's a fabulous way if you really are that interested in learning more about the community. Thank you. Well, I wanna thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, tomorrow evening, I think we're doing the same thing, 5.30, same room. And uh, anyway, thank you all for being here.